Yeah, hi everybody. As uh, I think um, we uh, discussed earlier uh, during the introduction, I think there's some new people. So I'm Gary Bader. I'm a faculty uh, at University of Toronto, and I'm going to give an introduction to what we're going to work on at, uh, and learn about during this course. Um, so um, as a reminder, Nia uh, mentioned that all of the content here is freely shareable, so you're welcome to reuse it. And um, even if you want to run your own workshops, so um, and and also modify it and improve it. Okay, so why are we here? Most of us are interested in genes and what they do, uh, their function, and um, this is not so hard to study if you're interested in one gene. Um, but if you have many genes to work on, uh, whether they're from um, you know a screen or uh, across evolutionary space or from any kind of big genomics experiment, um, we're usually stuck with uh, figuring out what they all do. Um, and this is sort of typically um, a problem in genomics, uh, any kind of genomics where we collect data on many genes. Um, and generally, we're interested in trying to understand what's interesting about these genes. What do the genes have in common? Um, what do they do? How are they related to a disease or phenotype that I'm studying? So, um, and uh, frequently the, the sort of starting point for analyzing genomics data is um, you might you might rank the genes by some score that you have, like a gene expression score, or you might cluster it to find genes that work similarly or have similar patterns uh, to each other because if genes have similar patterns, maybe they're working together in some way. Um, and, but then, you know, what, what happens next? So in this course, we're going to talk about what happens next. Um, one way that people have found is extremely useful to uh, uh, answer the question, what's interesting about these genes is to find out if they're related to known biology, known pathways, complexes, and, and functions. And we'd like to automate that because if you wanted to do that manually, let's say you had a thousand genes and you wanted to find out what pathways they were involved in, if you didn't have any other resources and you're just looking at the literature, it would take a long time to go through those genes. Um, so um, pathway and network analysis is the area of computational biology or bioinformatics that um, tries to automate this type of uh, activity and with the goal of helping to gain a mechanistic insight into big gene lists and frequently genomics data. The difference between gene list and genomics data is the genomics data often has measurements available with the genes. So it's not just a list of genes, it's also gene expression values or other things like that. And we might like to identify a master regulator uh, or drug targets or characterize pathways that are active in a sample just to better understand the biology that's occurring in the context that we're studying. Um, and in, in the context of this course, any type of analysis that involves pathway or network information um, is we're calling pathway analysis. Um, so the most popular type is pathway enrichment analysis, which we'll talk a lot about today, but there are many others that are available and useful. And so we'll cover some of those as well. In the next few slides, I'm just gonna give you some success stories of pathway and network analysis that we've used um, in our research that have um, that's mostly collaborative, uh, that has um, led to interesting insights into uh, and discoveries. So the first anal uh, analysis example I wanted to mention is um, work that we did with um, a lab that studies autism spectrum disorder. Um, the lab is Steve Scherer's lab at the University of Sick Children, uh, the Hospital for Sick Children nearby here, and they've studied the genetics of this uh, this disorder. Um, you might know that autism spectrum disorder is um, sort of a kind of spectrum of phenotypes that includes a number of different aspects, um, trouble with social situations, all the way down to really severe developmental uh, delays and, and uh, intellectual disability. Um, and um, it is known to have a genetic component. Uh, previous to the study that I'll tell you about, um, it, it sort of knew that we knew that there were some rare genetic single gene disorders and chromosomal rearrangements that caused uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, and people had previously, before this study was published, this was in 2010, so it's a while ago, but before this, people had a general understanding that copy number variants that were de novo or not inherited from the parents might be involved in explaining, say, 5 to 10% of uh, 
uh, ASD cases. So, um, and, and, but in general, not much was known about the genetics of this, this disease at the time. Um, so the SHARE lab uh, was very interested in this new, at the time, finding that copy number variants, especially de novo copy number variants, were important. So they measured copy number variants in about a thousand cases and controls. Um, cases are, uh, you know, individuals that had severe autism and controls were cases that didn't, or uh, individuals that didn't. And um, they used a SNP array to measure um, SNPs across the genome and then converted those to copy number variants. If you have a deleted region of a genome, there's no SNP measurements in a, in a region. And so you can say, okay, that's a deletion. And similarly, you can call gains. Um, and then they were interested in de novo ones that in particular that were rare, uh, which again, they thought sort of had a hypothesis that they were involved in the genetics. So they selected copy number variants from that list that were less, that were rare, less than 1% uh, frequency. Um, and they found um, that in general, ASD individuals had more de novo CMVs than, than expected. Um, and, uh, but they didn't find a lot of genes that were associated repeatedly in the thousand case, roughly thousand cases. Um, so only about 10 genes were associated from this analysis. So we thought we can look for, we can do a pathway analysis of all of the genes that were associated with all the copy number variants. And um, interestingly, we found a rich set of pathways that um, were seemed to be involved in this disease. So all of the circles, and we'll learn how to make maps like this later, um, this is called an enrichment map, um, and it's a, an, a method that our lab developed. Um, Ruth is one of the original developers, actually, of this um, software that made this. Um, and uh, all the circles represent pathways. Um, the size of the circle represents the number of genes in the pathway, and the lines that connect them, also called edges, represent crosstalk or overlap between the pathways. So if pathways share the same genes, they, they get us a, a strong uh, green line that connects them. And then um, so uh, and then the, the the white to red color represents how strong the genes on that pathway are linked to autism spectrum disorder cases versus controls. And so we found lots of interesting pathways, um, cell projection and motility, uh, different types of um, CNS or brain related pathways like um, neuron my uh, uh, cell well th that were involved in basically neuronal neuronal processes um, like CNS development, brain development. So and that that was interesting. However, and and kind of expected given that autism affects the brain. And um, however, we didn't um, a lot of the pathways were new. And so one of the questions that was asked, by the, our collaborators was how does this relate to known genes that we know affect autism and intellectual disability, which is a related phenotype. So we took all the, let's say 100 genes, intellectual disability genes and 100 autism genes, and we plotted those and their pathways that were enriched in those gene lists on this map. And that's what these other symbols are. So triangles are intellectual disability and um, parallelograms are um, autism spectrum disorder, and um, and we plotted those in relationship to all the copy number variant and rich pathways. And there was a bunch of overlap, which was interesting, as I was showing here. Um, but the interesting, um, one, one in particular interesting thing to me was how we found so much more bio biology from doing pathway analysis compared to looking at individual genes. And when we looked at some of these individual pathways, we found that... Um, Yes, there were uh, more autism spectrum disorder patient or individuals that were um, that had genes in those pathways than we expected, but it wasn't the same genes each time. It was different genes in different individuals, but it was always the same pathway. So when we looked at the gene level, we couldn't see repeated patterns. We just saw everybody had different genes that were affected. When we, when we mapped those genes to pathways, we found it was the same pathways over over time. So just that mapping of genes to pathways, just the bringing in the additional information about prior knowledge about pathways made a huge difference in the study um, in being able to find the patterns that we think are important in the biology of this disease. And I'll come back to that in a, a, again a few times, that general concept. So 
Um, the second pathway analysis example that is my favorite um, was work that we did with Michael Taylor, who's a neurosurgeon, a pediatric neurosurgeon, also at the Hospital for Sick Children. He studies, uh, his lab studies a penomoma. Um, a penomoma is a cancer of the ependymum, which is the lining of the central nervous system. And it's the most, uh, it's the third most common brain cancer in children. Fortunately, not brain cancer is not very common in children, but among brain cancers in children, it's the third most common. And people had known for a long time that depending on where the brain cancer occurs anatomically, it has different outcomes. And in particular, the most common and morbid location in childhood is in the posterior fossa, which is the back of the brain. Um, it contains the brain stem and the cerebellum. And um, gene expression analysis that we've done, um, also Ruth was involved in, in analyzing this data, identified that there were two classes of this disease. Um, previously, anatomically, they all, everybody thought if it's in the back of the brain, it's bad. Otherwise, it's not as bad. But just the ones that are in the back of the brain, there was actually, turns out, two types one that affect the, affected the youngest individuals and had a terrible outcome, and another one that affected uh, the oldest individuals, still children, but had an excellent outcome. Um, and that was determined just by gene expression clustering. Um, so we wanted to find out more about the genetics. And you know, in cancer, typically we expect mutations to be important. So we searched for mutations with whole exome and whole genome sequencing, but there were no mutations, basically. Based, just like, you know, very... Uh, surprising to me, but it turns out pediatric cancers actually have a much lower mutation burden than expected, uh, or than we expect from adult uh, cancers. Um, and so that was not actually that surprising given the context of the pediatric uh, uh, condition. Um, but moving on to another genomics data layer, DNA methylation, we found that the the uh, the PF posterior fossa type A that affects the youngest individuals was more transcriptionally silenced with CPG methylation uh, compared to the, the B type that affects, that has a better outcome. Um, and there were about 2000 genes that were differentially methylated, and it was not very easy to kind of um, figure out what those genes had in common. Um, if you just looked at them, uh, standard kind of looking through is hard to kind of know. Um, so we uh, looked at enrich pathway enrichment analysis with a large database that we collected um, from many different other databases. And what we found was that there was one pathway that was really strongly enriched in the 2000, in, in the 2000 genes that were differentially methylated. And that was a pathway that we collected from uh, the GSEA MSIC-DB database that was um, had collected uh, a set of genes related to the PRC2 complex. So PRC2 is a complex that methylates histones and then DNA gets methylated. Um, the targets of that complex have been mapped. Um, and this bar here represents that gene set. And then also they'd also mapped the targets of subunits of the complex, whose 12 and EED are proteins that are part of the PRC2 complex. Um, and the bar plot here represents the significance um, kind of measured as a as a um, uh, a number that converts the p-value into a, a number by taking the negative log logarithm of, of that number. Um, so the the higher, the longer the bar, the more significant the pathway is is enriched in the list of two thousand genes than expected. Um, and that's interesting. So we'll tell you all about how to do those statistics later today. Um, but the interesting thing biologically was that. Basically, no mechanism had been known to uh, be important in a pendomoma. There were no drugs or therapy other than surgery, surgery or radiation. And so this uh, PRC2 complex represented the first time that a molecular mechanism had been identified in this disease, in particular, the serious type A sub, uh, uh, subtype A of the posterior fossa uh, ependymoma. And not only that, people have been studying this PRC2 complex for a while and had identified various chemical inhibitors to it. Um, and the uh, those were tested in cell lines and, and mouse models, and they in they they killed preferentially killed the or specifically killed the ependymoma cells. And um, and so that was that was uh, very interesting. And then um, it was actually uh, basically validated as a mechanism through those experiments. And then clinicians 
on the team searched for drugs that might be already on the market that target similar processes. And they found a drug called Vidaza or 5-Azacytidine that inhibits DNA methylation, um, a related pathway. And so they were actually able to, because this uh, safe drug is on the market, they were actually able to test this in an individual. This is a child who came in with uh, posterior fossa type A, that the patient had reached the end stage of their treatment where the tumor had metastasized to the lung. And this is a picture of the tumor in the lung. And over two months, the tumor had doubled in size. Um, so at that point, there's no more treatments left for this patient. Um, they're just going to be in hospital um, uh, and, 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 and for the rest of their life. Um, so they tried on compassionate grounds to give this patient a course of treatment of this uh, drug, the on-the-market drug, and it um, stopped the tumor growing and the patient gained their energy and was actually able to leave the hospital. And that lasted for 15 months before the, the um, uh, tumor started growing again. Um, but um, it was enough information to start a couple of clinical trials and those are ongoing and still, and um, lots of patients are now taking this therapy, uh, which is definitely helping them. So. This is a great story for us because in a short period of time, just a couple of years, we went from knowing very little about the mechanism of the disease to identifying a mechanism and then a drug and then actually treating the patient um, basically within two years. So it's a great success story, I think, for genomics and pathway analysis. And we were also able to find uh, kind of, um, you know, because there was only one pathway that came up, we were able to conclusively say that if it wasn't for pathway analysis, we wouldn't have been able to, um, you know, if it wasn't for collecting all the data in our database and identifying that pathway, we wouldn't have made that link and we wouldn't have had, uh, we wouldn't have found that important mechanism. Um, okay, so a couple more examples I'm going to tell you about that are more qu uh, quick. Um, uh, the third example is um, studying these ependymoma tumors uh, more broadly. Uh, it turns out that there's um, not just posterior fossa type A and B, ependymoma occurs all over the central nervous system. Um, and um, we had lots of different data, gene expression data for, for these. Um, and we wanted to find out if there were any um, uh, differences between the known clusters of this disease uh, from gene expression data. So Previous work had found at this point, a few years after the ependymoma story that I mentioned, um, that there were nine types of this ependymoma um, by gene expression clustering. And we did a pathway analysis like similar to the one I showed you before and visualized it as this enrichment map view where the, the circles represent um, uh, the circles represent pathways and the size of the circle is the number of genes in the pathway. Um, and you can see links between pathways that are similar. And then we group them into bubbles that we label as kind of major categories of pathways. And then we colored them based on how prevalent these pathways were in each subtype. And you can see that um, a really nice view of the biology of all the different subtypes. There are certain pathways that are specific to specific subtypes. There are other pathways that are present in multiple subtypes. And so this summary just provides a really nice overview of the biology of the whole disease. Um, so the last example I'm going to tell you about is um, more recent, looking at single cell uh, transcriptomics data of five healthy livers that um, we worked on with the liver team uh, here in Toronto that uh, initially revealed 20 different cell types. Um, you might have seen these plots if you're definitely familiar with them. If you work with single cell genomics data, each little dot is a cell and they're placed in, in um, uh, space so that cells that have similar transcriptional profiles are close to each other. So when you look, do that, you see that there's groups of cells that are have similar transcriptional profiles. And it turns out those are major cell types like hepatocytes or different types of immune cell types. And, um, and so we've labeled those all here. Um, we, one of the interesting things that we noticed is there's a whole bunch of different clusters that we called hepatocytes. Um, and so we did a pathway analysis on this. It's maybe hard to see uh, all little, little dots here, but we, um, we also had some information about where the cell types occur anatomically in the liver. Um, and so um, the uh, we ordered the, so we made these little 
enrichment maps per cell type. Um, there's different clusters here, cluster five, 14, six. These represent these clusters here, um, like four, two, one, six here. Um, we ordered, ordered them along an axis of like an anatomical axis from periportal to pericentral, which is, um, you know, part kind of defines, helps define where blood flows through liver sinusoids and lobules, um, which I, I, I am not really explaining how that works. Um, I'm not showing you how that works exactly, but just to the, the take home message is that this is a, a prior way that we need to order things. Um, and then we, we visualize the pathways um, in kind of an anatomical view. And we found that there was an interesting division of labor among the different hepatocyte cell types. Um, if you zoom in on these pathways, you can see that there's a lot of drug metabolism pathways, which is under an important function of hepatocytes, but different hepatocytes at different parts of the anatomy do different things. Um, and so that was an interesting, uh, you know, um, description basically of the, the data um, that helps us kind of identify where certain functions occur anatomically. Any questions so far about any things I mentioned? Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through a little bit more um, general background now. Um, those are just examples, a few examples from our own work that uh, we're excited, we are you know, excited about, and it's just uh, hopefully motivating to kind of see, okay, these are real world examples where pathway analysis was important. Um, you can view it we, you know, to answer different questions and we'll teach you during this workshop how to do those analyses and other ones that might be related to your work. Okay, so um, coming back to a point that I made about the autism spectrum dis disorder um, uh, project, I mentioned that the genes that we identified as being important were not identified repeatedly across individuals but the pathways that were, in, were, were identified repeatedly across individuals. So I want to give you some kind of theoretical background or just an example of um, a the, sort of theoretical or conceptual view of how that works. Um, so exactly statistically why you get signal with this prior knowledge that we have when you didn't have signal in your data before. So let's imagine we're doing a genome-wide association study where we have cases and controls and we measure SNPs or mutations for all the individuals. Um, we have five cases. These are five individual people and five controls and other five individual people. And we measure a bunch of SNPs, A to F here. And if the individual has the SNP in one form, it's called one, otherwise it's zero. And the ideal situation for GWAS, stud, uh, a genome-wide association study is to identify um, a repeated pattern that's present in all the cases and none of the controls. So SNP A in this case is present in all the cases and none of the controls. And there's another SNP D that's present in all the controls and none of the cases. So if we saw a pattern like that, it would be a very strong signal. It would get a very good p-value in using GWAS statistics. Um, and we might conclude or predict that that SNP might be causal for the phenotype that we're studying. A more realistic situation whenever you do these studies and whenever we look at genomics data, it's very messy. Um, much more realistically, would you'll have like, you know, each individual here has a different SNP um, and there's no repeated SNPs. So now you're on the other side of the, you know, the worst case scenario. I showed you the best case scenario where the pattern is repeated. It's obvious. It's easy to see here. There's no pattern that's easy to see other than everybody has a different SNP. That's like the, the pattern and you can't really do much with that. Um, so, um, however, if we map the genes to pathways and let's say all the SNPs that we identified were part of the apoptosis pathway, we can collapse all of those, those single numbers down to um, make our perfect pattern again. So now we have a, a pattern where we've collected all the ones from all the gene measurements or all the SNP measurements, uh, we know that the SNP measurements are in the pathway. We rewrite this table so that instead of looking at SNPs, we're looking at pathways, and we're looking to see if there's a SNP in the pathway, a uh, given pathway in cases versus controls. And now, and 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 so we we 
cover that signal. So the increased statistical power that we get comes from two things, basically. One is aggregating the counts. So we take all of these counts now that were all spread out and we didn't see any relationship between them and we merge them together and now we see a strong relationship. That's the probably the most important type of meth, basically the most important um, uh, statistical technique that we gain from using prior information about how genes or SNPs are related to each other. Um, the other thing that I'm not showing you very much here is, and we'll talk about more later today, is it reduces multiple testing correction problems. So if you have multiple association tests, like we're testing if SNP A is related to cases, and then we're testing if SNP B is related to cases, et cetera, let's say we have millions of SNPs, there's a chance we just test, if we're just repeating the test over and over again, there's a chance that we'll get a significant p-value randomly. And so we need to correct when we're making many tests, we need to correct for that. And there's a standard statistical method for do, there, there are standard statistical methods for doing that. And um, it's multiple testing correction. So we'll talk about it later, but it reduces, if you, especially if you have lots of data, it reduces your ability to identify significant sign, signals um, in this case of pathway analysis by um, uh, reducing the number of tests that we're doing from you know, all the SNPs um, and merging them together into a, a smaller number of pathways, we reduce the number of tests that we do and increase our ability to identify signal without getting confounded by random um, significance results. And then the third interesting thing conceptually is that the pathway analysis gives us some mechanistic insight, ideally, into what we're studying. So if we're just looking at a bunch of SNPs, they're like, okay, the SNP A is effect is you know associated with cases. But now with pathway analysis, we say apoptosis is related with cases. And that is a lot easier for us to follow up on. So those are basically the, you know, the 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 key fundamentals between behind everything that we're going to be doing in the course. And anytime you see an opportunity to do this. Uh, in general, you can you can use these techniques and um, uh, improve your statistical power and interpretability of your of your results. Um, okay, so you know, uh, just one one additional example. Um, I didn't have a good publication example of this, but um, you know, in in terms of mechanistic understanding, um, here's a, a example of master regulator analysis, and this is you know, um, another way of explaining about me gaining mechanistic insight is that we want to explain the data in some way. So let's say we have uh, a bunch of samples. Each column here is a, is a sample, and um, each row here is genes, and all the colors are measurements of the genes, let's say gene expression data, um, with red being high and blue being low. Um, and we've grouped all of these genes. We've identified, say, hundreds or thousands of genes that are following some kind of pattern here. And we're, we we can identify the pattern very clearly in our data, but we don't have a mechanistic explanation for it. Um, one of the things we might be able to do, just as an example, is find out that the um, all the genes that are have a similar pattern are all regulated by the same transcription factor. And um, if that known set of transcription factor targets are enriched, they're present in this list of genes more than we expect by chance. Um, we might be able to say that this transcription factor is um, might be controlling these genes, and maybe that explains this big pattern that we see. And this is um, what we did with a PRC2 complex example um, in, a, in a way. Okay, so, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so just to summarize, and I'll go through a couple more slides um, explaining what we'll do for the rest of the class, the benefits of the rest of the workshop, the benefits of pathway analysis versus analyzing individual SNPs or transcripts is that uh, generally the results of pathway analysis are hopefully easier to interpret because they use familiar concepts. Um, we identify possible causal mechanisms like the transcription factor example I mentioned. Uh, we might be able to use it to predict new roles for genes. I didn't talk about that very much, but we'll talk about gene function prediction um, later. It improves statistical power in the way that I mentioned. And one way that I didn't mention is that it can be more reproducible across cohorts or studies because um, you know you can imagine if you did a GWAS study like the one I mentioned with the SNPs A to F, 
Um, and you know, every individual had a different SNP. If I look at a hundred individuals and they all have different SNPs, and then I go do that in another population, we'll probably have um, uh, another, um, you know, everyone's affected by different SNPs, but the pathway information is hopefully, if it explains the biology, it's likely going to be more uh, reproducible across those studies. Um, and it can facilitate integration of multiple data types. Like if you have different genomics layers, gene expression, and um, protein expression, and um, proteomics, other types of proteomics data. Um, okay, so um, finally, just the last little bit of information I want to give to you is uh, a preview of the pathway analysis workflow that we're going to be covering in the course. The general idea is that we have some genomics data or experimental data that generates a lot of information about genes. Um, we normalize and score it using standard methods, which we're not going to cover here, but we can ans answer questions about. Um, and that gives us a list of genes potentially available with scores. And then we learn about the underlying cellular mechanism with pathway and network analysis. That's the ideal. Um, and that would be, you know, involve visualizing and identifying interesting pathways, trying to find one that's interesting, like it's novel, and then we drill down on that and we look more detail into more detail about it and we might be able to publish that, that specific thing. Um, blowing this out into more detail, we have lots of different types of genomics data up here, different types of normalization methods. They all generate a gene list. And then we have ways of finding interesting pathways, interesting networks, and doing this mechanistic drill down. Each of these little boxes is a type of analysis and each highlighted yellow box is a tool. Um, we'll be talking about almost all of me, probably, well, most of almost all of these tools uh, in the workshop. So we'll come back to this. Um, okay, so that's it. The workshop outline, um, as I mentioned, just to summarize, it, is that we'll be working on pathway enrichment analysis, where we can summarize and compare um, uh, omics data sets. Network analysis can help us predict gene function, find new pathway members, um, identify new pathways. Um, we'll be also talking about regulatory network analysis, um, and to, which helps us find and analyze master regulators. Um, and, uh, and that's it for the intro. So right now we're on a 30-minute coffee break and networking session, so we can chat amongst yourselves.